again, everybody. Dan John here from danjohnuniversity.com. This is episode 118 of our podcast. Uh, I'm as surprised as anybody that it keeps going. Somebody told me that the average podcast goes for like three to seven times or something like that, and we're up to 118, which is a lot more than three to seven. <clears throat> I've been getting a lot of feedback from the, the university lately, and one of the things I kind of like is I have a couple of coaches uh, personal trainers and coaches who are using the site to give personalized training for multiple athletes, uh, multiple clients. And that is really why we designed the site uh, as we did, uh, is to give people a lot of help. Because those of us who've ever tried to organize programs, we know that so many things change so often and you're trying to program something. And if you've ever trained in a, in a big gym, you might even have this idea today. I'm going to come in and squat, and of course, when you when you get there, there is no uh, there's no squat rack. So you know you just kind of go, okay, uh, you know, someone's doing curls in it, or God only knows, you know, hanging clothes from it, basically. Um, so you have to change your workout. And one of the things uh, a lot of us are going to start to notice as we go back to gyms is the importance of having a program that you can you know change a little bit. Uh, now that the pandemic, I hope, is mostly behind us, but, you know, we're, we're not making good progress on it. Uh, but as we re people return to the gym, we also have to start dealing with other human beings in the gym. So, well, hopefully the generator can help you make quick options there as you change from, I was going to do back squats, well, I'm going to do jumping goblet squats now. Uh, we're still exploding, uh, adding new information every week over at the uh, university, and I hope you're part of it. Um, let's get started with the questions. All right. Our first question is from Terry with two R's. Uh, this next one is a curious question in that I've been contemplating whether or not I should get the DEXA scan as I, n I want to know where my body composition is at. I've had an in-body scan, but it was very inaccurate and I believe was a waste of money. Yeah, I think most of the scans. Um, I still am a big fan of the water weighing. Uh, uh, we did that in college, and uh, I know that some of these really high-end ones are, are, are better in some ways. Uh, I think the caliper ones are total nonsense. And even worse is that people tell you that, you know, if you have a certain number of millimeters here, it means you're carb intolerant. Who the hell comes up with that stuff? But sorry, that's just me. Uh, that's just me uh, ranting. The reason I'm asking is I had a DEXA scan four years ago when I was 26% body fat with really good training over the last 1.5 years. I'm pretty confident I'm around 17 to 18%. But I'm curious to know because I think it's a good way of determining muscle gain as I'm sometimes overly concerned with what my scale weight says and it fluctuates a lot. Boy, I tell you, is that true? Whew. When I do these road trips, I, I don't know what is in food uh, at hotels and airports, but I just come home so much heavier. I'm sure it's not the, the, the fun and games. I'm sure it's, the, it's something in the food. Uh, and it fluctuates a lot, and it varies within one to six pounds depending on time, day of the month, and so many other things. And it messes with my confidence and self-image. You know, Frankly, I think that's a much more appropriate question to discuss. Uh, why you're letting a, you know, a, a machine that, <laughs> in my case, it's next to my toilet, dictate how your day should be. Yeah, that's that's actually a good little line. Um, uh, and it's something, Terry, I want you to think about a little bit. Uh, you know, because honestly, a one, two, three, four, five, even six pound variation can, in my case, be from if, if I ate, you know, tortilla chips. I mean, I swear there are certain foods that I watch at football games that put more weight on me than, uh, you know, back squats and complexes. So I know it's not the best indicator, uh, and a DEX is. Any perspective you have on this is appreciated. Uh, you know, I, I, I know that DEXA scans became kind of a rage about a decade ago, um, and I know a lot of the people in California, you know, started living their, their life by it. Um, I there are a lot of measurements that have value. I've always been a big fan of the waistline measurement in centimeters. Um, but it seems like if it would go up a centimeter or two for some people, they really struggle. Um, I've always liked the way clothes fit, but in that great Frasier episode where they finish off by the, the 
cleaners are shrinking my pants. It just always makes always made me laugh. Uh, yeah, obviously, DEXA scan is great. Um, you know, spend the money. It's, it might be worth your time. Uh, it might also be worth your time to consult somebody like Josh Hillis. And um, Josh Hillis, H-I-L-L-I-S, because I think someone like him, and there's, there's others, of course, but Josh would be the, the first person I'd send you to have this uh, skill set of being able to say, okay, here's where you are, here's where you want to go, and he deals much better. One of the worst habits you can have, from what I've been told, is to weigh yourself every day. Having said that, we also know as a, as a body weight fat loss tool, weighing yourself every day is, is a real uh, value. Um, I would even recommend you to do something, uh, if this is an issue, maybe consult, uh, I like Rusty Moore's work, Lee Peel, P-E-E-L-E. -E -E. uh, I've always enjoyed her work. I haven't seen much from her in a long time. And of course, there's there's dozens of other trainers that one could trust. Uh, sure, I mean, you know, it all, I mean, I, I don't know why you need to, you know, worry about even, even at 26% body fat uh, uh, is, I mean, yeah, that's something to consider. But the fact that you even know it, and whether you're male or female, 17 to 18 percent is just is just phenomenal. Uh, I mean, certainly men could be a lot lower, but you know we're talking about basically health. Um, I sure wish you used another indicator for your fitness and health and ongoing body composition improvement better than a scale or even the some of these uh, fat loss measurements. I'm, I've been a big fan about how you, you know, how you wear clothes, you know, how you, your, your perception, but there, there seem to be some, and I understand it that there, uh, and I, of course, as the father of daughters, I understand it, you know, as well as I can, I think, but this thing about the confidence and self image, that's something I'd like to circle back to, uh, long term. Uh, Terry, this, this year, now we're sliding into areas that I'm really not qualified to talk about, but, uh, I, I mean, hats off for using the DEXA scale, but it's it's going to only tell you a snapshot on one day uh, <laughs> that, uh, you know, and you say here it took you 1.5 years to get to where you are now. Four years ago is your last DEXA scale. You know, I wouldn't want to be, I wouldn't want to be judged on what happens on one day of my life uh, or one evening of my life or one hour of my life. Um, I don't think I helped you very much, but... You know, this this little ramble of thoughts might help somebody else. Thank you, Terry. Gustav asks the question. I had a question about work capacity. You have the X amount of grocery bags going up, X amount of stairs example. More trips, less bags mean more stairs and a need for better conditioning. That's a good summary. One trip, all the bags mean more strength, and this entire spectrum is work capacity. Yeah, it's a spectrum. It's a It's a matrix. But the idea, and I hope you understand this, Gustav, it's not this. I don't necessarily want you to just be able to pick up the 365 pounds or, you know, 165 kilos worth of food and walk up and down a, you know, flight of stairs. I also want you to be able to carry 18 bags up 10 stairs. And I want you to be able to do a whole bunch of options. It's the options to me. The options of work capacity is what work capacity is. Well, that's a strange sentence. You know, if we have a thousand bricks, I, I like the option of being able to carry one brick at a time or 20 bricks at a time or 10 bricks at a time. To me, that's much more that those options are what work capacity is to me. And I think I just confused everyone in the world, including myself. Um, you said loaded carries uh, were great to improve as the monkey, as well as monkey bars and crawls. Well, sure. So to, to summarize Gustav here, I have said many times that work capacity is built by coaches like me with uh, loaded carries. And then, of course, there's other things like bear crawls, all, all the crawling family, uh, monkey bars, climbing, uh, running hills. I mean, there's a whole myriad of things you can do to increase work capacity. I think the most important thing is to not do one thing. That's why with even loaded carries, that's why we do sled pulls and prowlers and suitcase carries and sprint up hills. Um, I wonder how this relates to the gym. If I do a workout, I tire out rather quickly and I can't do what 
say, a bodybuilder could do. Yeah, because the bodybuilder's training, training for one specific thing, you know, uh, basic hypertrophy and, and lower body fat, and, of course, symmetry. Multiple exercise, uh, and then he explains how he thinks a bodybuilder trains multiple exercises for a muscle group and still perform. After heavy benches, my push-ups are nowhere to be found, well, of course. <laughs> and the work has made quite the impact on me. I was thinking of maybe doing routines like the humane burpee to work on work capacity by increasing the conditioning aspect in conjunction with some sled works and carries. And that's exactly how I recommend most people train. Something like the humane burpee and loaded carries. And there you go. Um, would this be the way to go? Yes, this would be the way to go. Or do I need more specific means like hard conditioning and specific muscle endurance? I'm not sure what specific muscle endurance is. I'm not sure... You're, I'm not sure you'd even, when people tell me like sets of 25 build, uh, you know, local muscle endurance, I always wonder about that because very rarely in the real world, uh, unless you work at a factory and you have to do, you know, you have to turn, you do this for, you know, you know, eight hours a day. I mean, that's muscular conditioning. Of course, you want to destroy the whole factory, just go like this for a few times. Um, yeah, I think. Humane burpee, I think loaded carries, uh, I think that's the way to go. Um, you have to decide where you want um, work capacity to be in your life. Uh, you know, it's weird. I think even at my age, I'm 64, I have a lot of work capacity. I'm still the guy you ask to help move in and out of your house. And I think it's because when I train, I do the Olympic lifts, I do loaded carries, and I walk, which builds a nice base of work capacity. I don't think I'm a genetic superstar when it comes to work capacity, but all my years of training has led me to have work capacity. I think that's more of the correct formula. So it's the quantity of workouts lead to work capacity, especially if you're doing things like sled pulls. Years ago, we were helping someone move. His nickname was Grandpa two times. And uh, this kid showed up. He was a, he was a, kid from Tooele, Utah, and he had this truck, and I walked over to his truck, and I started to put some stuff in there, because he was, it was his grandfather, and he said, no, 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 don't put anything in my truck, and I'm like, why? And he goes, well, I don't want to scratch my truck, and I thought to myself, that in a nutshell, that in a nutshell is what's wrong with the way most people train. Uh, he, wanted ha he wanted to have a truck that looks like he, looked like he did something, but he didn't want any scratches on his truck. I like stra scratched up trucks. I like athletes who, you know, can carry a few boxes. I hope that helps. We have a question from Logan. It is officially November, as he writes this, and I am planning to run Mass Made Simple for the second year in a row. Wow, okay. Currently, uh, I'm in the leaning out phase. Wait a sec, you're actually following the, my advice? Wow. Um, but hoping to get started before Thanksgiving. However, within the last six months, I have taken up Strongman and I've done very well placing him some local competitions. So first question, Logan, how many rabbits do you want to chase uh, over the next few weeks? Uh, my Strongman team practices on Sundays in an event day style, and it's sort of expected that we participate with the team. I am afraid that we are running into some FOMO, fear of missing out, while I am away focusing on mass game for six weeks during the holiday. I was extremely happy with my results from last year's NMS and trying to replicate, replicate that success once more. Just currently mentally torn between mass gain and running those addictive team event days. Any words of advice to overcome this self-sabotage mental block? No, I have none. Uh, I, I have retired from trying to help people who are uh, uh, chasing 500 rabbits at, month, at once. I, I, I just can't help you anymore, but I do have a solution for you. From a 28-year-old newbie strongman, um, finally, it is vital that I make the climb to about 230 pounds, 105 kilos. It will put me at the top of middle weight for the sport, and I can't think of a better way than to do Mass Made Simple. Okay, here's my solution for you. Um, do the seven-week method on Monday and Thursdays. Uh, Monday and Thursday, I want you to do uh, Mass Made Simple. Sunday, I want you to do a strongman event. Uh, Tuesday, rest. Friday, rest. Uh, Wednesday, I would do something restorative and try to make yourself feel a little better. 
Saturday, I do something restorative and try to make yourself feel a little better. Um, Tuesday is going to be a weird uh, accumulation of stress for you. But it's I don't think it's a problem. Just remember, do the seven-week, uh, it's in the book, do the seven-week option. Uh, uh, Monday, Thursday, Strongman on Sunday. Make sure you rest the days after those high rep squat days. And boy, you're going to be sore. I hope that helps. Thank you. We got a question for, from Jim. Do you have any thoughts on heavy club swinging? Yeah, I, I'm not a fan. Some I, I I've been asked this question a lot of times. I don't. I just don't like that stuff. I don't. I don't like the maces. I don't like the clubs. And then someone said, "Well, I see you. You know, I have these videos of me doing training with the Highland Games heavy hammer and the light hammer." And I'm like, "Yeah, that's the Highland Games heavy game, uh, heavy hammer and light hammer." That's not the same. I, I have my discus throwers do uh, the light and heavy hammer uh, swings to uh, build themselves up uh, to, to, to to throw the discus and shot farther. In fact, I have to remind myself to bring it for Emily today. Uh, I don't like them. Uh, I never have. I've never liked uh, Indian clubs, club training, mace training. Uh, I just don't like it. And But here's the thing. I'm going to get a thousand things underneath this. Well, Dan, have you tried? No. Yeah, I have. Stop. I don't like it. You can. It's perfectly okay for you to fall in love with all that stuff and do all that stuff. Good for you. Good for you. I don't like lunges. People push back on lunges all the time on me. I don't like heavy Turkish get-ups. I don't see any value out of them. But you do, or you know, gentle listener. And you're going to comment in below. I just don't care. I don't like them. Yeah, I like heavy swings with the Highland Game Hammer. I think there's great value to that but because it helps you throw the hammer and discus farther. Uh, I added clubs to my GPP program because it seems to work the side-to-side -side plane of motion where kettlebells work up and down front to back. Well, I don't agree with that, but you don't mention them in your podcast, so I'm simply curious if you develop strong opinions about clubs. <laughs> yes, Jim, I don't like them. I've been considering adding rucking into my workouts. Is there a difference in the workout when rucking with a rucking-specific pack Versus a sturdy backpack loaded with heavy stuff. There is a downside with the heavy ruck packs I found. They make them extremely thick right here. Uh, and it really pinches on a lot of people. Whereas with most backpacks, it's a little bit uh, thinner. So you can adjust it in and out a little bit. And I know that doesn't sound very uh, tough guy. But it's a pain. Um, I have yet to find a ruck sack, a, a, a ruck jacket that doesn't have, that I don't have to put an asterisk on when I recommend it. Um, I used to steal, oh, well, I didn't steal. Uh, at the end of the school year, I used to walk around the building and, and the students would just, you know, leave backpacks on the ground. Um, I would donate the best ones to the school. They had a little area you could, you know, that the kids in the fall could get free backpacks. And I took the ones that were a little bit more disgusting and we just threw like 16 kilo kettlebells in the back and they work fine. Uh, the nice thing about uh, the 16 kilo kettlebell is it's small enough so that it it, it doesn't uh, doesn't seem to bang into you as much. Um, and all you need to do, if you ever do get the bang in, is if you just stick your thumbs in there and go like this. And honestly, if you go like this a few times, it rotates to where it needs to be. Um, I did have someone tell me that they when they stick a kettlebell in a backpack. Then they also, but they wrapped it with towels first. And I think that's a great idea, but it just seems like overkill. I've, I just never really had, I, I guess sometimes the handle gets into your lower back and it's a pain. Never happened to me, but it's a good thing to know. I have some concern that a backpack full of stuff may overly strain the lower back. Well, I mean, I would never, I mean, 16 kilos is about as heavy as I'd recommend. Um, strain the lower back with 16 kilos, 35 pounds. I mean, people have been doing that load since the, the Roman Empire. Yeah, I, I guess it could strain your back. I, I, every Anything can hurt your back. I mean, you know, sneezing can blow your back out. But I, I, I just, uh, I haven't found that to be an issue. Rucking packs appear to be, uh, to put the weight on both close to the body and higher on the back. But maybe this isn't accurate. Geez, you know, I don't know about that, Jim. I, I know the one, the, the rucking pack I have has a big plate right here 
Um, but that's actually the plate that bugs me the most because it starts to drive up. And once I feel that uh, canvas start to rub up on my throat, I get I get kind of that whole, ooh, you know, and I have to pull it down. Um, I, I, I like rucking. I think there's real value to it. Um, I think there's real value to, to, to having a backpack on with a load. Uh, I've tried a lot of different stuff. I've had sandbags in my backpack. I've had uh, concrete, chunks of concrete that were in my, uh, my old backyard. Uh, there's, there's a good, there's a good way to clean up the chunks of concrete that the, uh, con construction crew left, you know, every day, go for a walk and go find someplace else to throw it. Um, yeah, I don't, I would be interested to know um, if you've had back injuries uh, from rucking. Uh, I've never had one. Um, honestly, the part I think of rucking that would probably hurt your back the most was getting <laughs> getting the equipment on and off. But, you know, your miles may vary. I hope that helps. Thanks. Ryan asked a question. I have recently read your article on e even easier strength. And I think it would work really well for me as a grappler especially as there's loaded carries in a load range of 15, 40 to 80%. However, I'm in a bit of predicament following a five-day schedule. I'm 19, so recovery isn't much of an issue, but I have a full co course load at college along with a part-time job, and I typically go to jiu-jitsu practice twice a week. Okay, I'm remembering correctly, hopefully, you've mentioned increasing the volume in the easy strength type program from 10 total reps for hypertrophy or other reasons. Would it be possible to do this on a three-day-a-week schedule of easing, even easier strength and still see significant results? Any advice would be greatly appreciated. Well, you know, Ryan, um, you know, the original program from Pavel, uh, you know, when Pavel and I wrote that book, you know, he's a big believer in easy strength three days a week. Uh, you got those great uh, Stephen Court programs from Germany for powerlifting three days a week. There's a million three days a week programs. If you're going to do, you know, I, I love even easier strength, but why don't you do Jim Wendler, his 531 program. I think that'd be far better for you. Uh, you, you say uh, uh, you're a grappler, and I don't even know what that means anymore, but I work with uh, Ultimate Fighters, uh, some people who are professionals, and we have them on uh, easy strength. And it's, fa it's funny because occasionally I'll get an email from somebody, and there'll be some interview uh, and they'll be like, "Damn, this guy's doing your program." And I, I don't comment because it's like, "Yeah, I know," because you know, I work with them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so Easy Strength is a great program for grapplers. The fact the, the, the if you can't find those, you know, those fifteen or ten minutes those on those light days, well, then you're, you're busier than I was in college. But um, yeah, I, I I would suggest doing Wendler's five three one. Or just any kind of any kind of three day a week whole body workout. Uh, don't overthink it, Ryan. You're 19. Uh, you're gonna you you need to get a lot stronger. I can guarantee it. Uh, you know because you know if you if you know if you can deadlift triple body weight and you have good fighting skills, uh, you can you know you have great crushing power. That's gonna help you a lot more than uh, uh, making a, any specific program fit. I hope that helps. Okay, thanks. We have a question from Kira. In a video I saw about the deadlift, you said either do it all the time as a practice or never deadlift. Well, yeah, I said, yeah. Yeah. In that video, you gave a program which was overhead press, pull up, ab wheel, and two loaded carries, a sled drag, and a bear hug five days a week, easy strength style. I wanted to try this, and as I have a sled and some kettlebells, but I also meet up with a friend every Saturday to train in a regular gym. This friend doesn't like the cold, and it's becoming winter here. I don't mind, but I'd like to continue with my friend for the social aspect of it. We usually do deadlifts that day, a push, a pull, and some hamstring work. Would there be any harm in me doing the program four days a week, and the fifth day being deadlifts instead of carries, still doing the overhead press and pull? Well, of course. There's, that's fine. Uh, there's, Gosh, I, I don't know... I mean, I can't spend 25 seconds without, you know, changing a program somehow. So, yeah, there's no problem with that. And I really think that Saturday workout for you, Kira, is really important because, like you said, of the social aspect. Having a social aspect of training 
is really helpful. Really helpful. Thank you. Enrique. I think we've had questions from Enrique before. Do you think the deadlift has a place in sports training, or is it better to use something like the power clean? If you think the deadlift has value for what, for which sports, for which do you think it is inadequate? Well, I got it. You've turned this in. You turn a good question into an either or. Yeah. You know, if if I'm working with an uh, an athlete right out of the blocks at age 12, they're going to deadlift, they're going to power clean, they're going to snatch, they're going to clean and jerk. Um, if I'm working with an athlete who's you know 58 years old who's never lifted before, but now it was totally needs, uh, I, I'm going to radically change everything. The deadlift is a great exercise. There's great value in it. I never needed it. Uh, I got all I got all I ever needed out of snatching and cleaning. It, it is going to be a little bit specific about where you are in your career. It's going to be about what you already came in knowing. If you don't know anything about weightlifting, the dead the deadlift is a good place to start because it teaches, the, especially the rack deadlift, because it teaches the hinge pattern. Um, to me, this is like asking me, uh, you, know, you know, overhead squats, I think, which are great. In fact, in just a few minutes, I'm going to do some. <sighs> but if you don't have the mobility, flexibility, or need, you shouldn't do them. So it's always going to be a much more, um, you know, you, you just have to think it through a little bit, and you should be fine. Um, I know that's not the best answer to a question, Enrique, but I hope it helps. Shalva asks a question. What is your opinion about so-called functional training? I, I don't know what it means. I have been around the whole functional training uh, movement, and the more I read about it, the more confused I am. I think it's anything that involves jumping up on something and standing there for a moment. It's very common now to see people slamming around medicine balls. Big fan, and it's not new. Doing landmines and various stability exercises. Uh, the landmine exercises, uh, like the hammer stuff, those machines, I understand why people do them. And then I also understand why most enough is enough. Uh, even many high-level UFC and football athletes are doing those kinds of workouts. Yeah, well, and also, too, rem see, Shalva, you got to remember this. Whenever you see a workout uh, on Instagram, YouTube, whatever, we're all just showing off for you. You, you don't put the norm. I mean, the normal workout for an American football player, especially a professional one, is you come in after the game, you know, one or two days later, and you put yourself in a hot tub and you go, I am so sore. And your workout that day might be sitting in a chair looking at film. Uh, this nonsense that you see these people doing, uh, very often it's just showtime, folks. You know, it's just a bunch of nonsense. Um do you see any value in this or is it just a waste of time? Yeah, it's not a waste of time. Or, and it's, There's value for everything at the correct time in the correct place where the person needs it. Uh, I mean, that idiocy I saw a couple years ago, the young lady up in Park City, she was jumping on a BOSU ball, uh, a Swiss ball, and um, they showed her jump up on it. And it was like, but then they showed the outtakes of her missing like 13 times. This young lady hit the floor a bunch of times just for that one video and my thought was how stupid can you be to have an elite athlete f hitting the floor with velocity over and over and over just for a one take that's stupid um is there value you know every question today is has been a tough one i think podcast 118 is going to go down as what i thought at first an easy one but i i am I'm getting honest with you. I'm, I'm, I'm getting almost frustrated because well, there's a bunch of either or questions here and there's all these things. All the questions are about small things that get us away from the important stuff here. If you're not push, pull, hinge, squat and doing your loaded carries, I don't want to hear about this other stuff. Uh, if you're not getting your sleep and you're not eating your vegetables, your fermented food, drinking water, this stuff is just nonsense. You, you know, you know, uh, I love uh, Tom Furman's book. You know, you can't outrun a donut. Um, you know, if you're you're going to ask me about, you know, what's the best way to lose body fat while eating, you know, 52 bagels a day, I, I don't have an answer for you. Uh, so functional training, uh, as I see it, what's functional is doing your sport. What's functional is getting as strong as you can appropriate to your sport. 
what's functional is getting eight or nine hours of sleep, meditating, drinking water, taking care of recovery, including, you know, whatever, you know, whatever self massage or whatever recovery tools you need to do. Uh, meditation, uh, sauna. Um, I got foam rollers in the gym. I've got that weird little neck roller thing. Thomas and Lindsay have that big back roller. You know, whatever is appropriate. To me, that's what functional is. I'll tell you what else is functional. <laughs> you know, um, if you line up in American football for an all-out blitz and my quarterback makes a good read and just pops the ball over, and that, the most functional thing we did that week was have the quarterback make a quick read, catch the ball, throw the ball. Um, you know, if there's, you know, with my discus throwers, preparing them for any kind of weather condition, it's an outdoor sport, you got to learn that, is far more functional than doing some silly kind of BOSU ball thing. So to me, the highest level of functional is a fully prepared athlete. Now, as a grandparent, you know, what's functional for me? I mean, I was just upstairs you know, playing with Leo, Leo was, um, and we were on the ground together and, you know, I was nudging him with my head and, you know, he'd roll, then he'd roll back and I'd pop up. Well, you got a 64 year old grandfather laying on the floor, rolling around with his grandson. I can't think of anything more functional than that. Wow. I kind of ranted there a little bit today and I, I guess I apologize, but, uh, well, that's, that's what happens. Um, Listen, if you have questions, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com. Uh, even questions that seem like I'm ranting doesn't mean I don't, I think they're stupid questions. It might just be that I was just on the phone half an hour ago with somebody and that, <laughs> who said something that really got me angry or something like that. Or I was on hold with my insurance company. That's another one. But uh, I love answering the questions. Um, one thing I hope you are beginning, if you are a, a, a listener who follows along closely, is very often one of the things I keep coming back to is appropriate. If it's appropriate to you at this time and in this place, then it's appropriate to do. And if it's not, well, it doesn't mean it's wrong. Put it in the shelf. Maybe you'll come back to it sometime. I'm Dan John from Dan John University. And this is episode 118 of the DanJohnUniversity.com podcast. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.